All right, everybody. So when we're thinking about oceans, one of the things I want to, bef before we just dive into like coral reefs or something, I think it's really important to talk about how oceanic life differ differs and how the, the system itself is just different. So, you know, when we first think about just all the different organisms that we see in, in the ocean, what we should think about is, uh, well, what's causing that, okay? Why do we see lots of little super colorful stuff and really huge organisms like the blue whale there? Why do we see all these things? Um, and I think the way to get at that is first just think about the physical system itself. How does the ocean differ fundamentally from other freshwater habitats? Pause the video, think about that. But here is the answers, basically. First off, when thinking about a physical system, well, the ocean is salty. It's big and it's old. Then in organisms disperse differently and there's a huge disparity in diversity, which we'll talk about um, towards the end of this lecture. So let's first talk about that salt, the osmotic environment, right? Uh, I won't go over these things again, right? Go back and look at le chapter two or the second one of the second lectures that we did. Um, you know, water as an environment. Um, but organisms need to do things very differently in different osmotic environments. And this com like allows or excludes whole phyla, right? So echinoderms. Um, we do not find any freshwater echinoderms. There are many, um, so those are things like sea stars, right? Um, sea cucumbers, sea urchins. We only find those in the ocean. They are osmotic, osmoconformers, meaning they don't control the amount of salt and water in their bodies. And that just doesn't work in freshwater systems. You can't do that. So whole phyla are eliminated from being able to be in freshwater. There are no, however, there are no exclusively freshwater phyla. There's plenty exclusively marine phyla. All right, size then. And we can think about size in many, many different ways. First off, area, right? 70% of our earth is covered in water. And what that means then is the processes work at larger scales. So when we think about across space, across time, Anything that happens in an ocean takes for flipping ever. Currents are moving across the ocean. Um, because the wind, right? So if you think, look at um, atmospheric winds, we generally have these trade winds going to the west. And then we see, okay, currents are going to the west at the equator. Um, and then generally to the east in the, the, the temperate zones driven by wind patterns, right? Um, these currents take a long time to be created, uh, but they also keep water moving, but it takes a long time for that water to move because the system is so, so huge. But these consistent currents then allow for a lot more filter feeding. So most everything is filter feeding in um, I should say most everything. There are many, many organisms that are filter feeding to the extent that um, much higher rates than in freshwater systems. Certainly than in freshwater lakes. If you're ever scuba diving, you should never be touching uh, the, the life like that. This person is bad and me. Um, I shake my finger at them. Anyway, um, the water then sits in the oceans for a long time, right? So take a big lake like Lake Erie. It turns over essentially every two years. So think what that means is you get like a new um, set of water in, well, sorry, what that is is how long, on average, how long does a water particle take to, once it goes into Lake Erie, how long does it stay in what lake area before it either gets evaporated or flushed out of the system? And um, 
you can, that's just dependent on inflow and outflow and the lake volume. But Pacific Ocean, once a raindrop falls into the Pacific Ocean, it's basically going to be there for 40,000 years. It might be underneath, not even in contact with the surface for a millennium or two. So the, the time processes go much, much longer in, in these systems in compared to, to other areas. Then, what, because water takes forever to circulate around, the nutrients are um, bound up and it's hard to get new nutrients into the system. So think about, you know, the great big open ocean. This spot here is a long ways away from any nutrients. Basically, you only gain nutrients when you get in contact with the substrate. So the open ocean might be several thousand miles away from any ground, any nutrient source, and it's old water that has been sucked dry of nutrients for potentially, you know, hundreds of years. So what we see in the ocean, all productivity is really di driven by di nutrient dynamics. It has nothing to do with really competition and predation. It's all bottom up of how much nutrients. So when we think about, you know, a super clear ocean water, the reason it's super clear and, um, and you can see so far maybe 200 feet underwater is that there are no nutrients. There are no algae in that water. It's just pure water. And one thing that's weird about it is in freshwater systems, we see there's phosphorus and phosphorus is the nitro limiting nutrient. Sometimes it's nitrogen, it can be, but adding nitrogen can have some effects on the, on the system. But what we see is most open ocean water is iron limited, okay? Um, and you can see when you get a big dust storm in Africa, a lot of those, that dust and dirt that's blown up into the atmosphere gets deposited into the Atlantic Ocean and you can get phytoplankton blooms because it adds a lot of nitrogen, or sorry, a lot of iron into the system. So a lot of people um, back in the 90s, early 2000s thought of, hey, we have this carbon problem, we're increasing carbon, well, what about um, rather than growing trees, let's fertilize the ocean and let's put a bunch of iron into the middle of the ocean and um, what that would do would this is the like the general idea put a bunch of iron in the water you get a huge growth of phytoplankton which captures the CO2 the CO2 would go into those plankton those dead plankton would sink past the thermocline and reach the depths and stay there for essentially either forever or at a rate that's long enough that it would um, help with um, mitigating climate change. So, you know, you could put a tax on climate, uh, on carbon that like, you know, for every X number of tons that you have carbon that you produce with fossil fuels, you have to pay for this much iron to um, sequester that carbon. But when you think about it, what's actually happening here? They're essentially just making the ocean eutrophic at the spots where they're dumping off this iron. Um, and as we know, that's not necessarily a good thing. They did a, um, in a big large-scale experiment here, the Southern Ocean Iron Release Experiment, Soiree. And what they saw was they, they tried this, adding a bunch of iron fertilizer, and it never really sediment, sedimented out. Um, it's, um, the, the growth was too slow and it, it basically just spread out rather than sinking down. And it, this kind of idea has been abandoned at least for now because it's um, just probably not that great of an idea to make a huge portion of our ocean eutrophic to um, stop climate change when we're trying to save our oceans. Anyway. Um, one thing is that you might notice is that ocean animals are bigger, right? You don't get whales. The largest fish you find in freshwater systems is the beluga sturgeon. It's a 
<coughs> uh, can be a little over 7,000 pounds uh, or right around 7,000 pounds. Um, where blue whales though are way, way, way bigger, right? Um, and it's probably just has to do with resource limitation. Habitat size is at some point tied to productivity, right? Think about how big of a pool would you need to be able to grow one blue whale? It would need to be something that could sustainably provide 1.5 million kilocalories a day, and that's about 8,000 pounds of krill per day, right? And any freshwater system, even if the system was the size of like Lake Superior, you know, you wouldn't even be able to have enough blue whales in Lake Superior, even if it was productive and not oligotrophic. Um, that the, the, the habitats just aren't big enough themselves. So speaking of size of animals, I think it's really cool when um, we talk about carbon sequestration right now. Right now, the general ways to do it is either plant a tree, right? Because you plant a tree, um, which is a carbon sequestration machine, um, or you pump the carbon way down deep underground and hope it stays there. But um, some people are saying that actually whale populations, um, be one of the reasons for we uh, are seeing increased uh, carbon dioxide, and now this is, or one, I should say, one way that we could potentially try to increase uh, carbon sequestration was to have a whale population, uh, an intact whale population. But um, since we basically killed off our old whales, all our whales, um, that think about what a whale does is it grows and has tons and tons of biomass tons and tons of carbon locked up in its body for potentially hundreds of years um, the oldest whale that's ever found was in 2007 um, it was the uh, an Alaskan community harpooned a whale and they found it to be 130 years old and the reason they knew that was because they found a old harpoon lodged in its vertebrae that was used before the time that Moby Dick was written, right? So 1860s, 1870s. And that was um, probably an adult whale back that long ago. So um, if you have this much carbon locked up in a huge body for a long time, when you think about population scales across the planet of whales, it might actually do something to have a noticeable impact on the amount of carbon that is locked up in these, these organisms. The ocean is bigger. It's deeper, right? Much, much, much deeper than any, um, any lake. The deepest lake is Lake Baikal, right? It's a mile deep, uh, but the, you know, the average ocean depth is right around, you know, four or five miles deep. Where we see then is this makes a huge difference in light. Light only goes down for the first 3,000 feet, about, you know, 1,000 meters. Remember that heating is restricted to that upper portion. Now, the oceans are well mixed because they have obviously a huge fetch, right? The distance in which wind can blow across that, that um, the ocean. Um, but you still see, you know, a thermocline that might be just a couple hundred feet deep. Uh, below, you know, that three or four hundred feet down, you have a con constant temperature at right about four degrees Celsius. Um, as you get towards the poles, you can get some colder water. But um, realistically, you know, all of this is all the same temperature. So all of that deep water then lacks photosynthesis. So what's growing there and what um, what's the food source? Well, there's plenty of organisms that live there but at really low densities because all that they're able to eat is corpses and feces that are raining down from above. And that is what we call marine snow. Um, if you go down deep in a submersible and you shine a light, what you actually see is a lot of really slowly sinking organic particles. And that's just basically dead stuff, poop, 
Um, dead phytoplankton is kind of conglomerated up into little clumps, but um, what you see is most things are just, um, most organisms are filtering this, this stuff, and um, where you do find larger organisms that are um, really slow metabolism, slow swimming, slow moving organisms that are adapted to not come across food very often. So things like gulper eels or um, organisms that are adapted for whale falls. So check out a whale fall vi video. I'll put the link in the description. It's pretty cool. And you might think, well, how like uh, common are whale falls? Like, because we find this huge d abundance of uh, of life on these whale falls, and how like predictable is that? Um, and I think it's interesting that when you have like in the Atlantic Ocean about two million whales, um, <coughs> you. Um, See, whale falls are really not that common in the sense of a whale fall every 1,300 square miles. But when you do cross the Atlantic, you're going to pass within one mile of at least 10 whale falls, right? Just giving the math there. So whale falls are very, very common. So the organisms that can um, use these areas are, are at least in some sense of the word, able to um, be adapted to this feast when they come across the whale fall, explode their populations, but then be without a whale fall for a long time until they can find one. So check out that video, it's, it's pretty interesting the, the type of organisms that we see there. As we go down deep though, we know that the pressure super super gets, gets super strong, right? Um, the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, about 30,000 feet down, is a thousand atmospheres, right? A thousand times atmospheric pressure. And uh, any organism that has air spaces in their body just can't deal with that. They just do not work down there. Those air spaces will get collapsed in an instant. So deep organisms don't um, have any gas filled spaces, so they can actually, um, they have to um, the, the, they're just all water on the inside. So the water doesn't compress and it, they can actually do a decent amount of vertical migration without having to worry about, um, you know, the earaches and the sinus aches that we get as we go scuba diving just within, you know, the first 10 feet of water. So you might ask, well, how do they regulate their buoyancy? How do they stay afloat? Well, they have hydrofoils. So those are little fins that they stick out that as they swim, they can stay up. They have really reduced skeletons. So pretty much anything you find in the deep down ocean is um, has very little skeleton. Look at this little gulp. This is a gulper eel and the bones are extremely fine. Uh, and then they just are squishy. They increase the amount of fat so that they can um, have some bones or have some uh, more dense body parts, but if they can make up with it with uh, lower density fat, then they can keep neutral buoyancy that way. So that's it when we're thinking about size, but let's think about age. The age of the ocean is um, kind of unimaginable, right? Terrestrial ecosystems, really we only find things coming out onto terrestrial ecosystems for half a billion years, 500 million years. Uh, but oceanic life, we've had oceanic life for over 4 billion years. And what we know is that time begets diversity, right? The longer organisms are in a certain place, the more diversity that you will have. So what we see is that there are 15 exclusively marine phyla, when we're talking about animal phyla, right? Um, and so some of these things are like echinoderms, cone jellies, which are essentially a type of, kind of like a type of jellyfish. They're, they're, they're different than jellyfish, but um, they look the same at least. Lorisiferins and acorn worms are, uh, you know, just a handful of phyla that we only find in, in salt water. Now, what, does that mean that echinoderms will never make it into fresh water? Well, uh, I'd never say never, but you know, 
some of these organisms might eventually evolve a way to get into fresh water, but I kind of feel like if they haven't done it in four billion years, they're not going to now. What we see when we compare fresh water to salt water then is the organisms disperse in very, very different ways. Um, Freshwater organisms generally disperse as adults. So this is a mayfly, or no, sorry, this is a midge coming out and dispersing as an adult flying around. This is a mayfly emergence that you can see. This is the mayfly emergence and this is at La Crosse. So Minnesota, Minneapolis, right? And what we see is that the, um, as the, the hatching, the, the mayflies come out, that you can actually pick them up on weather radar. It's pretty crazy. I've been a part of this in, in um, lakes up in northern Minnesota, and um, the road actually can get slippery with the corpses of all the dead, dead mayflies. But what, what's happening is they're dispersing as adults, which is fundamentally different from how most marine organisms, whether we're talking about fish or invertebrates, disperse. It's not really no. I, I I'm not really sure why, but I think um, uh, what what's happening is you find that so many species are having to um, for any of the sessile things they're gonna ha be producing eggs and sperm because they themselves can't move as adults, but their eggs and sperm can move around in the water. So you get a bunch of larvae that are out in the water and able to disperse that way. So overwhelmingly, um, you find most dispersal um, from larvae or as their meroplankton uh, for a short amount of time. All right, that's everything for how oceanic life differs. Um, stay tuned to talk about different habitats that we find in the oceans.